Hello and welcome to episode 187 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at Andrew RP. Joining me as always is the moist League Freak. You can find on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? How do you know I'm moist? I see all. I'm oh, here and everywhere. No, no, I, I borrowed your fingering stick. <laughs> I'm a fingering stick, yeah, I like to keep that moist, actually. I was going to say, it's just, you're acting like you saw my weapon earlier or something. Um, how are you been? Yeah, not too bad. It's been a good day. Yeah, it's been all right, eh? Yeah, coronavirus is peaking again. Yeah, the, the old Rona the, down there in Melbourne means that uh, money's coming in, eh? Yeah, yeah, business is picking up. Yeah. Life's good again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it also means that there's a lot more morons getting out when they shouldn't be. Yeah, well, like, you know what's really weird to me? is the Victorians? That, yeah, pretty much. Case yeah. closed. Um, that there was all of this thing when we had the first wave of coronavirus or COVID-19, as they ended up calling it, Um we had all of this stuff about you've got to take it seriously. You've got to socially distance yourself from people. You've got to stay indoors, not go out, all that sort of stuff. And most places in Australia kind of eradicated it for the most part. But now that it's all like flaring up again in Victoria, all the health, offic- all the health officials are like, yeah, it's, don't, don't worry too much about it. It'll be fine. You know, you can still go out a little bit. It's not too bad, and it's a little bit weird to me. Well, the the, the only change they made in Victoria was, oh, we found that the majority of the increase has been coming from large gatherings inside the family home. So everything else is going to stay as it is, but instead of being allowed to have whoever you want in your house, yeah. you're back to only having five people in your house other than the people who live there. Okay. I thought, that's not stopping anything. No, no. It, that's it's just, that's just words. Yeah, pretty much. It's very strange. I hope they get it under control again because well, they just you know, need to go into lockdown again. Yeah, it sorry, seems like sorry it. everyone, but that's what's got to happen. Yeah, I agree. That way, I don't have to deal with morons on the train anymore either. <laughs> I want lockdown purely for my benefit, and not everybody else's. <laughs> I'll be honest. I I did pretty well during the lockdown, so you do great work. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. So, um, there's been a bit of drama going on at the Warriors. Yeah, look, the Warriors, uh, there was was a little bit of a discussion today on Twitter about the Warriors, and it made me think what we should do is maybe talk about what the Warriors should be doing going forward, the changes they need to make, some of the things they should do, some of the things they shouldn't do, and generally what our opinion is about the direction the club should go in because they got rid of Stephen Kearney and yeah, it was harsh, but it seemed pretty fair when you looked at his record and there's a lot of talk about who should be their next coach and things like that. So I thought we should talk about it today. Sounds good. I'm all keen. Okay. So I think the first place we've got to start at is the coach. Now you and me have talked about this before. We both think Jeff Tuvey is the man for the job. Absolutely. Um, there's other names that have been tossed up. Wayne Bennett's name has been tossed up. I think he yeah. would do a certain job there, but he's obviously not going to be a long-term coach for them. Now, Wayne Bennett for me is the coach that you bring in when you've done the rebuild and you need to go to that next level. Mm-hmm. And at the moment, the Warriors are still trying to do a rebuild. They've been stuck in rebuild phase for since about 1998. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. They they need to finish that rebuild, get that squad working fine, and then go, right, let's go to the next level from there. And they're going to need a coach who um, is willing to stay there for a few years. And when I say a few years, I'm talking at least four. That's and what I think too, yeah. I think Bennett's probably looking at coaching for two or three more years maximum. I don't think he's looking long-term anywhere anymore. Yeah, unless so, he's going to Brisbane again, like, and maybe not the Broncos, maybe, you know, if the second Brisbane team comes in or something like that. But he he's not going to go and live in New Zealand for the next four years. That's for no. certain. No, I mean, even when he became England coach, he still went, fuck it, I'm not living over there. Yeah. <laughs> so he's smart. Yeah. Um, 
The other thing they need to do is they need to put a broom through that roster. I agree. It's um, They've got too many passengers, too many players that, you know, the, the level that they're hitting, their very best football is passable first grader. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a list of the players that have got off contract at the end of this year. Okay. You tell me, yes or no, whether you would resign them for next season. Okay. Jared Beal. No. Adam Blair. No. Lachlan Burr. No. Jackson Frey. Don't know him. Blake Green. No. Patrick Herbert. Uh, no. Peter Hicku. No. Adam Kieran. Don't know him. Tane Milne. Uh, no. Jack Murchie. No. Isaiah Papali. I might keep him. Uh, Leah Vaha Pulu. No, I don't think I know him. No. Nathaniel Roach. No. Tyrone Roberts Davis. No. Well, that's settled that then. Wow. Um, <laughs> that's clean out. Yeah. And then, obviously, they've freed up a bit of coin there. Mm-hmm. Who do they buy? Well, here's the, here's the thing, right? I think if I'm the Warriors, the thing I would look at is my junior development. Because I don't... If I'm buying for the Warriors, I'm looking to buy finishing touches. And they've been pretty good at some of those sorts of plays before. So uh, think of someone like a Brent Tate, for instance. Like, he's a pretty... You get someone that's a, an origin quality centre that comes in. Steve Price was another one. You get a, a really good, solid front row where you know what you're getting for, is his best game and his worst game. And there's nothing between it. You know, players like that are, are really good buys. I don't think the Warriors should be the sort of team that goes out there and says, oh, look, we got to buy a, you know, a, a fringe first grader or, or a bench player. We need a good bench player. I think they should only ever be looking at buying a finishing touch sort of player. Um, Roger Tuivasa-Shek is a fantastic player. He's a great buy. They brought him to the club. I don't think the Warriors have a problem attracting talent like the free agents to the club which some people say they do. I think the problem is that overall, the club over the last, especially eight years or so, has been really bad at its junior development. And it needs to get back to being able to produce good young juniors that come into the team. They're ready to rock and roll. Now, I don't know what the change has been, but there's definitely been a change. Because they used to produce... You think of the likes of like... In the early 2000s, when they had like Tupi, uh, Tupi, Lautiti, Jones, like they, you could go through a bunch of them. And, and they, even when they weren't going great guns, they were still pretty damn good players. They just weren't putting it together. I'm looking at this team now, and for the most part, they're actually not real good players. Yeah, I think one thing that was that stood out for me is. Remember that NYC competition we used to have was the mm-hmm. under twenties comp. Mm-hmm. The Warriors dominated that every, pretty much every year. Mm. So they they did have the pathway there, mm. and they were attracting the best young talent around. Part of their problem was they couldn't retain it, mm-hmm. and I think that's still going on because let's be honest, it's not like the only Kiwi players in the game or, and the only Islander players in the game are only playing for the Warriors. No. They're everywhere. And yeah. they come from somewhere. Why aren't the Warriors hanging on to them? And I think their their ability to spot talent, the right talent, and keep it is a huge issue. Yeah. Possibly their biggest issue. Um, and now they're going through this phase where they're trying to just build up as you know, as many forwards as they can in their pack. Let's just buy every Ford that's on the market. Mm. And I'd say, clean them out. If you want to buy a Ford, there's one on the market at the moment. Go and put in a bid for David Fafita and then focus on your spine after that. I wonder with their junior development, if they if they look at players that... 
and it's it's really difficult because you never know who is going to kick on and who isn't. But I wonder if they look at their junior players, their best junior players, and they maybe target players that are, are more suited to dominating at the junior level than ones that are going to be able to build upon their game and be better first grade players. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, and that, that's the thing. I think they tend to go for the junior forwards. Yeah. They're not really looking at playmakers, and they they need to. They need centres. They've got they've got a pair of decent wingers in Malmolo and Fusatua. Yeah, they they produce pretty good uh, wingers. They um, always have. Hayes Perham's a very good player. Um, I don't know why he's not getting more game time. Um, they've got some decent young talent in the halves. Harris Tavita, I don't understand mm. why he now hasn't played a season and a half of solid first grade football because every time I see him play, even when he's played out of position. I'm always really impressed with him. Yeah, uh, he's, he's a very good young talent. Um, they just need some finishes. And they need a forward pack that is going to bloody rip in and, you know, scare the shit out of people. And at the moment, teams come up against the Warriors, so they're not worried about them. They're not worried about Remember when the Warriors had this crazy attack? They just score mm-hmm. points from anywhere. Mm-hmm. They don't have that anymore. No. They're so bland. It's like watching the Dragons. But it's yeah. less frustrating. And um, the, the problem is, though, they've like... And remember, they used to be really good, but they would always fade. In the last 20 minutes, yeah. it was like clockwork. And once they got that out of their system, they become a really, really good team, a really dangerous team. And then a generation of their players, like, basically retired, you know, over a few years. I feel like they haven't really replaced a lot of the, those players. And what you have now is a team that, I mean, we saw they broke the record a few weeks ago for most consecutive sets of six uh, in a game that were completed. Yeah. But, you know, the Warriors of old, if they had have had that record, they would have scored 70 on you at a canter. This team struggled to beat. I think it was the Dragons they did it against. Um there's only, like, you look at this team, there's any really, I, I worry about their wingers, because their wingers are good, and Roger Tuovasashek, there's really nobody else. Oh, and there's, uh, what's his name, we were talking about him before, um, Katoa, he's the oh, only yes. other one that, that you need to really worry about. Everyone else, they're just average. Yeah. So they, they've got a bit of work to do just with the roster. They they need to get Tuvi in there. I'd even suggest they need to get a genuinely good, recognised assistant coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know they've got it at the moment. I've got a feeling it might be David Kidwell. I might be wrong, but they they need to get they need to get pr- a proper, strong, successful coaching uh, structure in place there. Um. And they do need to get players who are close to the peak of their careers at the moment over there to build up a strong team that they can build off and then get some juniors in there to play with these guys when they're at the peak of their careers, learn from them, get that experience with them so that, you know, when they're 23, 24 years old and those players they've bought in, uh, their their contracts have moved on, these young guys can move into that role. They've got the experience and they're close to their peak already. That's when you get to your premiership window. That's how you do it. Yeah, I agree. The thing that I find really strange is that when the Warriors come come around to having to sign a new coach, some people start talking about they need to sign a coach that can fit in with the culture of the uh, the Pacific Island hmm. players. And, yeah. like, I, I don't understand that. I, re- I think it's... I think it's misguided. I can understand where some people think that uh, it might be a good idea, but like, if if you're a professional footy player, you're a professional footy player, and I don't think the Warriors need uh, like I think if you got Craig Bellamy, for instance, and he was coaching the Warriors, I, I don't think any of the Warriors players would be upset with the way that he handled the club. I, I don't think it's. Huh. 
it's something in, they've got to be looking at. I think you just go for whoever is the best coach available that you can get. It's an utter nonsense argument because every single NRL team has New Zealanders, Pacific Island players in them, and they're mm. all coached by every other damn coach that's been around since, you know, God knows how long. From all different walks of life, all different ages, all different areas, and they coach all these players. Yeah. I don't see why that culture thing is, is something that needs to be yielded to, especially when it's a culture that hasn't brought a huge amount of success. That's a culture that needs to change. Same thing goes for other clubs like the West Tigers. Mm-hmm. You people talk, oh, you know, you may not buy into our culture. You know what? Your culture sucks. You need a new one. Same thing happened at uh, the Newcastle Knights where it was like, oh, we need somebody that knows the Newcastle way and they got to know the Newcastle culture and stuff. And it won them a bunch of wooden spoons and they were terrible. Uh, you get in somebody that is just a coach. They don't care about all of that stuff. You want to keep your culture? That's fine. Keep losing. But we're going to do it this way and we're a professional football team and this is how you win games. And funnily enough, they start going better and start winning games. Yeah. That's all right. And the whole culture thing is just a, it's just a bit of a furphy for mine. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, now, one of the things that was talked about, one of the coaches that was talked about online today was Sean Wayne. <laughs> now, we got to talk about it, okay? He, he was successful in Super League. Now, you know what I think of that phrase. And he's been linked to that job before. And I, there were people online today that said that the Warriors should look to sign him and then sign some English players. Now, I pointed out Andy Platt. I pointed out Sam Tompkins, you know, and I was like, what, why do you want to go back to these sorts of players? Who was the other bloke they signed? I, I said him today. I've forgotten his name. There was Platt. There was, uh, you know, in the early days, who was the other player? The other forward? Den- Dennis Betts? Yes, that's it. Dennis Betts. And his dog? And his dog, but the most expensive dog in rugby league history, by the way. Well, actually, I take that back. Yep. <laughs> I take that back because yep. they spent two dollars. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, man, rugby league. you got to love it. I believe that there. Uh, look, the problem with citing Sean Wayne's Super League career, okay, and his mm-hmm. percentage there, take away the, the comments and your, your feelings about the Super League. Yeah. Okay. There's only been genuinely three teams that have dominated that comp in the last 20 years. It's yeah. St. Helens, Wigan, and Leeds. Mm. And Wigan has probably been one of the best. You know, Wigan and Leeds have been the top two teams out of those three. And he was there. I'd argue that you could have put any single human possible as coach of that Wigan team in that competition, and you would have had a very similar strike rate with success. Because yeah, like you're at least a one in three chance of doing what he did. Yeah, and so that's the thing. If he had have been getting you know a sixty-seven point four percent success rate while coaching any team other than Wigan, Leeds, and Helens, then you know what, you might have a good coach because that's a pretty impressive record to have in a competition that has been skewed towards those three teams for years. Yeah, decades. And I, like, I go back to someone like a Brian Noble, who was coaching Bradford in the early 2000s. Bradford's winning everything in Super League, just can't be beaten. And they ended up making him the Great Britain coach because obviously, you know, he, then they're going to do it the British way. And he was completely outcoached in every single game that he, he was the coach of. Um, and it was like archaic outcoached, you know. He was just not up to standard. And as soon as he wasn't at this all-conquering Bradford team, when he had to go elsewhere, he had absolutely nothing. And we've seen some of the teams over in Super League, like they will have a coach that has won everything. And that coach moves on and they get the next guy in and he wins everything as well. You know, Um, I, I just can't go by Super League. You know, oh, he's great in Super League means nothing to me because we've seen so many freaking coaches that were great in Super League that could not do anything once they left that team. Would you like a stat? Yeah, hit me with one. Sean Wayne. This is this is Super League coaches, okay? There's okay. there's success rate. Okay. 
when they're ranked from highest win percentage to lowest, yeah, all right, there's there's 119 coaches all up. Mm-hmm. Sean Wayne ranks 11th with 67.4 percent. Who do you reckon's a tenth? Tenth at 72.5 percent success in Super League. Wow, that's only tenth. Holy crap! Mm. Man, if that was the NRL, you're like an all-time great. Yeah. Um, and he coached 109 games while he was there. 79 wins, four draws, 26 losses. I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna toss up a name. Roy Simmons. No. Who? You're on the right track though. Oh really? Has coached Penrith before. It's not Matthew Elliott. It's Matthew Elliott. <laughs> you want 70, 72. Wow. Five percent higher than Sean Wayne. Wow. Number nine was Mike Rush. He only coached 22 games, 72%. Yeah. Graham Murray, uh, 72.9% from 59 games. Brian McLennan, 73% from 89 games. Daniel Anderson, 75.3% from 93 games. Michael Maguire, 75.4% from 61 games. And then Frank Endicott and Ellery Hanley. Oh, my God. 76.5% from 34 games. Number two, Justin Holbrook, 81.3% from 80 games. Number one, coach 22 games, 86.4%. Graham West, he coached Wigan in 1996. Really? Wow. That Wow, those win percentages are outrageous. Yeah. They're, um, they're completely outrageous. So there's... 18 coaches who have got 60% or better. Whoa. So who's, okay, so who's from 10 down? Um, so Sean Wayne's at 11, Eric yeah. Hughes 12, Tony Smith 13, Adrian Lamb, Stuart Raper, Brian Noble, um, tied for 7-8 is Kieran Cunningham and Dean Lance. They're both oh at 60%. Goodness. See, Kieran Cunningham, if you go to, to St. Helens fans, they were... And Karen Cunningham's like, they love him as a player. But as a coach, to say they were furious at him is an understatement. And yet, mm. look at his record. 60%. Yeah. Um, 19 was Daryl Powell and 20 was Nathan Brown. Wow. Trent Robinson be... was Trent Robinson 21, Roy Simmons 22. Okay. Now, to be fair to Nathan Brown, he coached Huddersfield for a very long time over there. Yeah, I'll admit, I think Nathan Brown's record is pretty impressive given he was coaching Huddersfield and he changed a lot of structures there and made them better. Yeah, yeah. And then he padded his stats a little bit when he went to St. Helens because that was an easy way to jack the the percentage up a bit. But what he did at Huddersfield was nothing short of a miracle. Yeah, and he changed the way a lot of other Super League clubs were playing because he got so much out of so little at Huddersfield um, and he really worked on their defence, and it was outst- it was an outstanding coaching job he did. But, and I've said this before, he, he come into the NRL, and I, I think his NRL record is just crap, you know. And I think that before he left for Super League, and when he come back, he come back into a terrible situation. But I just don't rate him as a coach. No, I think Super League's his level. Yeah. So that's those are some interesting stats. Mm. When so if you want to look at success over there, Sean Sean Wayne at Wigan had a worse win percentage than Matthew Elliott. Yeah, and Matthew Elliott was at Bradford. Mind you, yep. Bradford were very were the top team at the time. Well, from so that's memory, a pretty fair comparison. From memory, Brian Smith was at Bradford, right? And then Matthew Elliott took over from him. And then Brian Noble sort of took over from Matthew Elliott. Mm-hmm. So. Both had, both had less um, win percentages than Matthew Elliott by quite a bit. So he was the best of the lot of them, huh? Yeah, Elliott 72.5, Noble 60.2. But and... Noble... Brian Smith was fifty four point eight. The thing about Noble, though, he was his his percentage would have been hurt by going to uh, Wrexham, I think it was at the time. Was it Wrexham or uh, what? Crusaders? No, yeah, it was Crusaders. I think they changed from Wrexham to the 
Yeah, Sel- and then he had or yeah something. the year and a half at Salford as well, which wasn't good either. Yeah, yeah. But that was only 54 of his 230 odd games. That's still a whack though, 54 games mm. of, of like properly losing. Yeah, true. And his test record is abysmal. Um, six from yeah, fourteen. Six from fourteen. It, that probably makes him one of the best coaches I've had in the last forty years. I would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking either. <laughs> oh shit. Um, yeah, don't get an English coach, please. No, we're begging you. Yeah, we've we've made that point pretty clear. Yeah. Um, Tuvi is perfect. He's off contract. He's ready to go. And he wants um, to coach him. Yeah. I'd like, even consider getting Anthony Griffin over there as an assistant to him. Yeah, if he could, if he would do that, uh, they should do it in a second. Um, the other thing I would do if I was the Warriors, I'd look at how much uh, broadcasting revenue they bring into the NRL. And I'd sit down with Peter Volandis and I'd say, look, Peter, we're bringing in all this broadcasting revenue and we want to get something back out of it as a club because it's no good to the NRL to have the New Zealand Warriors struggling the way they are. And I would look to try and get the... Because the the um, New Zealand Warriors now are owned by the Auckland Rugby League from memory. Um, I would look to get the NRL involved in the junior development and, and even if it was money or whatever or get them to look at the pathways that are there because the pathways are obviously not working at the moment because they the NRL needs a strong New Zealand Warriors team. You know, whenever there's a strong New Zealand Warriors team, there's a real buzz about the game. And to know that there's two different countries that are really paying a lot of attention to the final series is fantastic for the sport. Yeah. And I, I think that that's something that I would definitely do if I was the Warriors. I'd, I'd be you know, in the year of the NRL constantly saying, you know, we need sport, we need sport, we need sport. And it wouldn't even be directly to the club. It would be to, you know, the the entire New Zealand rugby league to a certain extent. And I'd be saying like, you know, is there something we can do to, you know, develop rugby league's pathways through the entire nation? I'd be looking to get, you know, I'd, I'd say, and I think we've both said this before, I, I think that, we should have the next magic round that we end up having should be throughout New Zealand where you've got all the NRL clubs maybe starting next season's NRL season by playing all the games in, in New Zealand, throughout New Zealand. I would be doing that constantly and saying, we are your outpost here and we generate way more money than we get back from the grant and it's time that the NRL invests in New Zealand Rugby League. Fully agree. Um, and it'd be... It'd be a step in the right direction, too. It, it's mm. got to happen. Um, but there's so much that needs to be done there. Do you, do you think they need new ownership? Is the ownership that's something that's an issue there as well or not? Well, they've just changed ownership. It was uh, Eric Watson, and they, they're they now, I believe, owned by the Auckland Rugby League. I believe that's who it is. I, I They haven't been owners for long enough to really judge them on what's going on, especially when you look at how they've come into this year. You know, I think you've got to give them a good five years or so before you can get a feel for where they're going with the club. And part of me feels as though the sacking of Kearney and the ruthless way they did it was almost like a really good sign because it shows that they're just not going to put up with it, even in trying circumstances, this this losing effort that they're seeing. So I mean, so far I would I would give them a pass mark to be honest, but I think you've got to wait another five years or so before you can say, hey, this is the sort of leadership they're getting from the top. Yeah, it's so frustrating. They've got so much that's so much potential there, mm. and to be churning out the same tired results every year and slowly going downhill every time it's it beggars belief there's no reason for it they've got an entire country at their disposal yeah and a ton of islands around them just punch out tons and tons of talent like it's coming off a bloody conveyor belt and 
they can't get their hands on it. They can't capitalise on any of it. And these teams in Sydney that are so much further away, and Melbourne and Brisbane, you know, they're grabbing they're grabbing all these players with with ease in comparison. Something's something's wrong within their recruitment area, not just in the junior pathways, but even just recruitment. Just you know, how how did the Warriors miss Semi Radraza and um, Mike Acevo and Sulia Savunavalu and so on and so forth? Yeah, how are they like not the team that. that's getting those players players first? Yeah, it, it, because they should be. Like, yeah, why are, why? isn't kick out on the Warriors. You know, I know he's Fijian, but it, it's like th- they should be the gateway to the Pacific Island nations. Exactly. Okay? They, they, and the, they should be the first stop. And I understand why you get Fijian players and, and players throughout Samara and, and stuff like that. And I'm talking about the ones that, that actually come from the islands, not the ones that were born and raised here in Australia. Um, they should be the first stop for those players and they they need to cultivate that to a certain extent because a lot of clubs in in the nrl that are based in australia have cultivated that you look at the melbourne storm they've done a really good job with that so i I just think that they need to maybe have a look at the players that they are are deciding they're going to bring into their first grade team it's obviously they're the wrong players and they should never be beaten to the punch by a, another club in Australia. Like, and we've seen it. In the past, they haven't been. We've seen that they have got the best of the best in the past. So mm. why has it stopped over the last few years? They really need to determine why. No, I fully agree. Um, I was going to ask a question that's, um, you know, off on a bit of a tangent. Mm. Yeah, we're currently... There's there's some conversation going on about um, you know expansion teams and who the next teams the team or teams are going to be. Yeah. Do you reckon the Warriors being as poor as they are hurts New Zealand's chances of getting a second team? I think it 100 percent does, but I think at the same time, if New Zealand got a second team, I think that the uh, the competition between them would. And I think there's no doubt the talent is there for a second team. I've said this before. If you said that you were going to start a second New Zealand team for the 2021 season in the NRL, I don't think you'd have any problems getting talent. Um, I think that the they would have to be completely different owners of that team. I don't think that they could have any links with the New Zealand Warriors in any way because there's been talk of that in the past. I think they need to be two completely separate organisations. And if that happens, I think that the uh, competitiveness between the two and just the way that one side can say, okay, that's the way they're doing things, let's try a different way, I think that will help New Zealand Rugby League immensely and in turn help Rugby League you know, in, in Australasia overall. But where do you base that team? Yeah, that's that's the big one. Mm. Because um, I don't, I think there's been talk of basing them in Wellington, but I, I think that if you want to showcase rugby league at its best, you can't be playing at a cricket stadium. You know, you got to be playing at a proper rugby stadium. So I wonder if you look at Christchurch, it is where you would play them. <sighs> Yeah, it's a hard sell, Christchurch, because of the, uh, you know, the South Island being massively, you know, enamoured with rugby union. Yep. Um, I'd be, I'd be thinking maybe uh, Wellington. I mean, and that's the default one that everyone goes to is Wellington. But I just think, I, I don't like the idea of starting up a new club, and you're playing at a cricket stadium, and I know they play rugby union there. But I think that to get the best out of the game, you've got to be on top of the game. And, you know, that's what I would always aim for if I was the NRL, is we've got to make sure we've got a venue that shows this game off properly. I don't want people to be saying, oh, yeah, look, I, you might get 20000 to the game, but, you know, the view's crap, or you're not on top of the action. You've got to be on top of the action to get the most out of rugby league, in my opinion. 
And I know Wellington is a layup in a lot of other areas in terms of commercial success and stuff like that. But I, I would want the second rugby league team or NRL team over there to be a, about putting on a spectacle and it not just looking like it's plonked down. And I think that, that you get a little bit of that when you're playing at that cake tin. How about Hamilton? So I I, I've I've thought about you know that stadium that they've got down the south um, in I think it's in Dunedin from memory that's an indoor stadium Forsyth Bar Stadium that's what it's called oh yeah yeah it's an indoor stadium it's only a small stadium but whenever there's an NRL game that's been played there it looks amazing the atmosphere looks fantastic and the games are always really good there. And I wonder if you could set up a team somewhere like that. But the the problem is that the commercial side is not going to be anywhere near as strong. And it's going to be a real balancing act. Maybe end up being, you know, you call yourself the South Island, you know, whatever's, the Orcas or whatever. And you play a couple of games here, a couple of games there. I don't know what's going to work best. but And that's more for people in New Zealand to make the decision on. But... I definitely think there's enough talent for a second team, and I do. I think that that second point of difference that you would have against the Warriors, I think it would eventually strengthen both sides. Um, so if we go with, with Christchurch. Yeah. Play at there's... Rugby League Park. Yeah. Um, what, what name should they have? Should, should we call them the Quakes? No, I think that would be a terrible idea. It's a bad idea. Yeah, really bad idea. What could you call them? I look. I, I remember there was going to be the what? The Christchurch Quackers. The Quackers, man. The first time that calls themselves the Quackers, they're my second team. <laughs> what could you? I don't know what else you could call them uh, in New Zealand. What else is uh, New Zealand known for? Jandals. What? Jandals. Jandals. <laughs> the Christchurch Jandals. The Jandals. Or the Christchurch Chili Bins. The what? Chili Bin. What's that? An Esky. Is that what they call Eskies over there? Yeah, Chili Bin. Oh, wow. Because it's a bin and it's cold, so it's chili. Yeah. Chili yeah. Bin. I don't know. That's up That's up to the Kiwis to work that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Brisbane Bombers, man. I'm, I don't live in Brisbane, so it's up to the people in Brisbane to work out what they want to call it. Maybe I do like the, the Orcas, though. The Orcas, I thought, were pretty cool. They could call themselves maybe the Christchurch Bombers. The Christchurch Bombers, yeah. Do they have a... I mean, I guess they've got an airport there. Yeah, they've got an airport there. Yeah. What What would be a Christchurch Actually, something? I, I've just thought of something that's brilliant. It's to do with Christchurch. I have been there. Yeah, I haven't, seen The Christchurch Cookies. Why Cookies. Because they're the home of the world's of the Guinness World Record um, holding biggest cookie ever made. How big was it? Fucking massive. Ah, oh, that's a <laughs> that's this, a measurement length. They, got, they had a shop out there called Cookie Time. Yeah, and they had yeah they made this cookie. It was, it was I, I don't know the actual dimensions of it, but it had many many people standing around the edge of it. Nice dozens. And that sounds good. It was, a, it was a big ass cookie, and mate, their cookies are fantastic. They can call themselves the Cookies, and they can okay. get that Cookie Time character out there. Yeah, you could dance around and do stuff. You could throw cookies to the kitties. You know, they've got the uh, the Crusaders had to change their name because mm-hmm. it was politically incorrect. Oh yeah, so what do they call themselves? I have absolutely no idea. I just remember when it was all going on. I saw it on Twitter. And I was like, okay. You know. Will the will the Raiders have to change their name? Doubtful. 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 Yeah. No, but rape, raping and pillaging is still okay. <laughs> it's, it's fine apparently. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you'd call them, but I'm sure they'd come up with some. I I like the idea of local names. Like that's why I love the idea of West Australia Quackers, because I think that would be bloody amazing. And anything you like, that's why I like the Penrith Panthers. 
because that's you know there's the legend of the panther that lives in the the uh, blue mountains mm. things like that i find really really cool paramatic eels is maybe the best name ever in in, in all of australian sport so i i like those local names so i'd leave it up to wherever the team was based but i do i think a second a second new zealand team i'll bring them in next year if it was up to me what about the rabbit hoes the rabbit hoes yeah that's got a local historically significant name about it in new zealand no no it's for south sydney you're talking about great team names oh yeah but new, the rabbit hoes are, are an introduced species that's the problem yeah but they were they were killing them yeah, I guess that's a good point. Yeah. What's another cool name? Like, the seagulls is pretty good because the seagull is a, an Australian animal. Well, let's be honest that there there is only one team name that is more awesome than any other in the world. <laughs> I know who you're going to say. That's I can't the, say the, their first name, but I can say the rest of it. I'm pretty sure it's the Vaclavi Mad Squirrels. Yeah. He's even best. got angry eyes and they're red. Yeah, if you're if you're thinking of the mad squirrels, it looks exactly what you're thinking of. Yeah, he's a pissed off squirrel. Yeah. I want their merch. So do I. If anyone's out there and they've got a bit of money and they want to do me a favour, get me some mad squirrels merch. I agree. Yeah. Fantastic. I'd like a mad squirrels hat. In fact, I'd like to see any team in the NRL, just adopt MAD on their mascot. Imagine if you're playing against the West MAD Tigers, the Penrith MAD Panthers. The Penrith MAD Panthers. <laughs> the, Paramad, the Parramatta MAD Eels. That's a that's hard to say, that one. Yeah. The uh, Cronulla MAD Sharks. <laughs> the, the Canterbury MAD Bulldogs. That's a good one. <laughs> there, is, there is a bit of a downside, and that's the Melbourne MAD Storm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a bit weird. Yeah. The Mad Quackers. Oh. The Mad Quackers. Oh. Mad, mad Roosters doesn't really have much of a fear factor about it, but you nah, know. not at all. Nah. The, the Mad, mad Rabbitos. The Mad Rabbitos. Well, you know, you give them red eyes. Yeah. What's that What's that uh, virus they get? Was uh, it the Khaleesi one or was it the uh, Myxomatosis? I think I'm thinking myxomatosis. Oh, yeah. Mm. There we go. There we go. People, teams, you've got to put mad in there. Yeah. Make, make your mascot psycho. Yeah. Fear. Look, look, if you're going to sign psychos to your team, you might as well make your mascot look like a psycho as well. Exactly. Get those crazy eyes on. The mad raiders. Yeah. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> well, we're just fixing shit here. Yeah. What, what else is broken we need to fix? Um. Well, what else? Well, th- there's not too much news in the NRL at the moment. Uh, the New South Wales Rugby League signed uh, Brad Fittler through to the 2021 State of Origin series. So yep. that was a little bit of news. Um, I wondered on Twitter whether he took a pay cut in the same vein that he said that the referees and, and touchy should have taken a pay cut and to stop being selfish about it. So that was a question I tossed up. Um, what do you think about that sign? It's pretty. It's a no-brainer move, yeah? Yeah, it's pretty safe. Yeah. And the weird thing is that like, he could be coaching uh, the State of Origin series, what, I think it's in October, November this year. And then it'll be like June the following year. So it's not going to be a very long time between drinks for him coaching the New South Wales team, unless the State of Origin series goes off at the end of the year and they decide to make it at the end of the year every year. Although we've got the World Cup at the end of next year. Um, Wayne Bennett had to go at the media today because... Good Sorry, what? Good on him. Yeah, yeah, I thought so too. He had to go at the media today because there was speculation that he would leave before the end of the 2021 season where he's contracted through to and he basically you know gave it to them said i'm sick of this this happened when i was at the broncos and he said that i moved on and they'd actually sacked me and he was just done with their bullshit which i think everyone's done with the media's bullshit at the moment in rugby league um 
And that's it, really. There hasn't been too much news. Uh, Jake Trebojevic is... No, sorry, Tom Trebojevic. He's out for, I think, eight weeks with that hammy injury, so that's a pretty bad one. And, yeah, basically it's all full steam ahead for the Panthers as they charge towards the Premiership this year. All right, and uh, I'm just looking on the uh, the Fox Sports website here. Paul Kent has broken a story. Oh, really? Kind of. Mm-hmm. He's given his opinion. Let's be honest. That's what he's done. <laughs> um, journalist Paul Kent has revealed an awkward dressing room moment that suggests Anthony Seagold has lost the support of his Brisbane players. He asked his players if they backed him, and all but two of them sat looking at their shoes. Okay, that's a that's a weird one. Why would, what type of out-of-control coach would stand in front of his team and say, do you all back me? Yeah. Sounds that doesn't sound real to me. Does that sound real to you? It sounds like horseshit. Yeah, it sounds like something that a journalist. You know how journalists write things that they don't actually that like they think that's how human beings are because they're not human beings. They're soulless. Yeah. Well, yeah. The funny thing is, okay, this article, um, it's <laughs> it's only got quotes from Paul Kent. And Paul <laughs> Kent doesn't say where he heard these quotes. So here's oh, what Paul him. Kent said. So these are just the Paul Kent quotes in this article. Yeah. The Broncos are in a little bit of trouble. What insight? Yeah. Seabold said to me the other night after the Manly game, if I'm not the right bloke for the job, then tell me. Two players stood up. Two said, no, mate, you're okay. And the rest of them sat looking at their shoes. There's issues up there. The sad thing about what's going on at the Broncos is that they're not actually turning it around. It's just a snowball that's getting bigger. It's the runaway train they've lost control of. Another great bit of insight. Mm. At some stage, someone is going to have to come in with clear instructions and get a clear result and turn it around. This is the first time you would say the Titans are a chance of getting them this week. I wouldn't say that, would you? (laughs) No. I will tip them, though, just for the hell of it. I'm not. I'm going to tip the Broncos. Um, oh, there was—you know what? There were some rumours mm. that the Roosters are going to make a massive offer for David Fafita to lure him from the Broncos. Um, but they're always connected to every single player that's off contract. So, but it did upset some people on Twitter, which I always thought was funny because Twitter's normally such a nice and happy place. Yeah, I um, I was having a discussion with a few people today, which went quite a bit off track. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of people on there at the moment who seem to think that the words black and white are automatically racist. Yeah, that's weird. But hey, how about, uh, did you like my post that I did about Redskins, the Redskins lollies? <laughs> yes. It was, it was a good one, eh? That was a good one. For those that don't know, we've got lollies in Australia called Redskins. They're, I think well, they're... we should say, had they used to be called that. They've now yeah, had they... their name changed. Yeah. And because the the name Redskin is racist, obviously. Um, And I've got no problem with them changing the name, like whatever. But the thing about Redskins were years ago, they used to be like, so they, how would you describe them? They were kind of like a big, thick uh, stick of chewing gum, but it wasn't chewing gum. And it was like, I think they're rose water flavored. Would that be right? Or raspberry flavored? Raspberry. Yeah. And, they were really rock solid. So if you bit into them, your jaws would be stuck together for like, you know, until such time as it all dissolved. And they've been made a lot softer recently. Um, But yeah, they changed the name of them and another lolly called Chico's, which I I didn't understand. I don't know what Chico means. Somebody said that it meant child in, in Spanish. So I don't understand that one. Yeah, I I don't understand it either, but um, if it's a decision that they've made and they think it's the right thing going forward and socially mm. acceptable and whatnot else, then it's their product. They can call it whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, I, I didn't really care. I don't no, know why but, other people did. But what would yeah. you call Redskins instead of Redskins? Um, ooh. Like if they called them Jawbreakers, that would be a cool name change. Um. Oh, it's just sort of a good word, and it slipped out of my mind. Ah, oh, damn it! What's that? Um, what's that stuff they use for fillings and teeth? 
<laughs> Isn't it like uh, Mercury? Oh, it's no, got, not Mercury. It's got a name. I don't, I don't know. I just call it feelings. Yeah. I can't remember now. But yeah, you, I, I call it whatever those feelings are made of. What if they called it like, um, instead of a catchy name, they called it like a, raspberry, like a really long one, like raspberry-flavoured, chewable, um, oblong-shaped lolly. <laughs> like that's the whole name. Raspberry amalgam. What's that? Uh, what's that stuff that they put in? Putty. They could call it raspberry putty. Raspberry it just, putty. It just smooths over all the little grooves in your teeth. It used to be like a. Uh, what's like that? A, actually, be like a mouth guard. Yeah, that's well. That's how I used to when I was young. I used to put them in like a mouth guard. I think everyone did. <laughs> yeah. You ran the real risk too when you were, you know, you were getting rid of your baby teeth. Yeah. If you put them in there and you had a loose tooth and you just let it sit in on your teeth, if you try to pull it out, it ripped the fucking teeth out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's look if you, the old ones, if you bit down on them with good teeth, and then you really ripped your jaws apart, there's a good risk you're going to pull the te- tooth out anyway. Yeah, I know they're a lot softer now though. Maybe they could just call it pliers. Pliers. <laughs> <laughs> You could, uh, <laughs> what if they, you know what? Quackers. Quackers. <laughs> quackers. Just call everything quackers. They're so adorable. Yeah, let's just go with quackers. Yeah. Those little I'm chicos, a... you just call them quackers. Yeah. Put them in the shape of a cockatoo. Yep. Not a cockatoo, but a quacker. Yeah. Yeah. Do not want to confuse people there? I'm just like, uh, just on the, co- seriously, we need to get somebody that, works for the, or is high up in the West Australian Rugby League and just convince them quackers. Mad quackers. Yeah, mad quackers. Look, yeah. like, Nick Livermore is very lucky that he's going for a team in Brisbane because if it was West Australia, I'd be badgering him. I, he'd be getting emails. Yeah, every mate, day. Like mate, every have you changed it to Mad Quackers yet? I can get someone to draw up a, a logo for you. Mad yeah. Quackers. It's, it's going to work, man. It's going to work. Oh, it'd be so fucking great. <laughs> That's where the gold is right there. <laughs> I need to see a Mad Quackers logo. Yeah. I bet there is a... a there's got to be a Quackers team of some sort. How do you spell Quackers? Q-U-A... Q U O double K A. Okay, yeah, you're right. Quaker. I know. And then logo. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a there's Quaker Gaming. Yeah, their logo's crap though. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like there's anything that's named Quaker's. Mate, you know what I should do? Buy the buy Quaker's dot com. It's quackers.com a thing. See, now this is starting to sound like what we talk about just regularly <laughs> when we're not recording. What website can I buy? It may be for sale. Oh, guess what I'm buying tonight? A quacker? A mad quacker. Mad qu- oh, Don't make me buy both of them. Fuck. I, I can't afford... <laughs> I can't afford more than one. Let's have a look here. Just so everyone knows, League Freak will be buying both websites. <laughs> Fuck off. You what can guarantee it. Tomorrow morning, dot com. type in www.madquackers.com. Okay, quackers.com. It, it will redirect you to leaguefreak.com. Mad Quackers. Guaranteed. It's a this, this bloke... Has an issue <laughs> with these websites. Don't. I'm I'm rubbing my forehead. I I can't afford more domain names. Yeah, I tell. You, okay. No, I'm not doing that. I, I will buy all these domain names you people out there want, but I you have to sign up to my Patreon if you do it because I can't afford all these domain names just to keep you all happy. That needs to be your last tier. Yeah, <laughs> but I'll right. buy a domain. <laughs> I'll buy you a domain. 
madquokers.com is available. That is so going. What could we have on madquokers.com if the, if the team doesn't get up? I've got no idea. What if, we a, ju- what if we made a Mad Quokkas website and we just started beef with the Mad Squirrels? Ooh. That would be cool. Online beef. Yeah, with the Vlakabi, uh, the, the Mad Squirrels. Yeah. But where would we say the Quokkas are from? Oh, it, you know, it would need to be a complicated, pronounced Australian place name. Yeah. Uh... No, only off the top of your head? No, there's no names in Australia that are weird names. The Woolloomooloo Quokkas? Wool and Gabble ones? Wagga Wagga Quokkas? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great name. Oh, man. That's, that's brilliant. That is. Where's another really weird name? I, I found an article that says, can you pronounce these Australian town names? I wonder yeah. how many are from out where I come from. Okay, Danil- go for it. Daniloquin, there's one. Yeah. The Daniloquin Quokkas, that's two Qs. That's pretty good. Um, Ningen. Eh. Udenata. Mm. Kubapedi. The Kubapedi Quokkas. That's got a bit of a ring to it, eh? It does. Gundawindi. Oh, Gundawindi Quokkas, that actually sounds really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, Maui. Mm. Um, Jinjin. Jinjin Quokkas. And it's in Perth too. Oh, really? Mm. Jinjin sounds like the name they would give to a panda. (laughs) 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 Um, Zantippi. It's the only place in Australia beginning with an X. Where's that? Uh, good question. I don't know. Okay. So you go. That that was the ones I had on here that were the hardest to pronounce. Okay. And I just smashed them. Yeah, you hammered them. So yeah. What what did we go with there? Gundawindi Quokkas. Gundawindi Quokkas. Yeah, that probably sounds the best. Hey. That's that's cracking. The yeah. Gundawindi Mag Quokkas. Quokkas. Just just see if that URL is available. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a thousand bucks if it isn't. <laughs> um, so, uh, but how's about I ask you something completely different? Okay. Have we had any emails? Uh, let me have a look. I can't remember. Let me have a look. I don't think we have. I'll tell you what, we haven't had any um, reviews Mm -hmm. or any five-star ratings. So, come on, people, put a heap in there. Uh, Oh, we did the six again rule. Yeah, Yeah, we haven't had any new emails. I can tell something to everyone. I am redesigning com, So it's going to look a bit screwy over the next probably week or so until I get it just you know settled down and working properly um but it should be easier to navigate it's going to be a bit more of a straightforward website because I realized that we needed a website we could chuck things up a little bit easier and that would be more integrated with everything like Instagram Twitter and all that sort of stuff so it's all going to be integrated and it'll all work together it'll be great you'll be able to um go and see each individual episode that's on there. You can actually go and see that now. Um, you, you can get a general idea. It's going to look a lot like the uh, rugby league podcasting network.com just because that website has been working so well and has a really nice layout. So I thought we'd do that with our podcast as well. And um, hopefully once it's all set up and finished in about a week's time, it'll just be easier for everyone to use. And we, even me and Andrew can use it a lot easier. So I thought I'd let everyone know what was going on there. Sweet. And there'll also be a link up there for the (laughs) madquokkas.com.au. Probably. (laughs) (sighs) That will be the title of the episode. Can we t- <laughs> can we tell people where they can help me pay for all this shit? Of course, go right ahead because if more people start paying for this, then there's more websites we can get you to buy. 
Exactly. Go yeah. to patreon.com forward slash league freak. There is three different levels. You can start off at $3 a month, $5 a month, or $10 a month. It's all in US dollars, so keep that in mind. Uh, look, it's the price of, you know, one to three cups of coffee a month, and you're, it's all sweet. Look, And if I get, like, even one or two people that sign up for that after listening to this episode, I buy madquackers.com, and it's all sorted, you know. And, look, I will buy is weird website addresses if you want if we start going down that road but you got to sign up to the patreon because otherwise i end up paying like 120 bucks a year on you know madquackers.com and all these weird website addresses and it just becomes a bit too much you know what i mean he's so gonna do it though i really am as soon as we get off of this recording i'm gonna i'm gonna have to buy it yeah it's it's burning a hole in his pocket he's sitting there going Come on, Fergo, finish this episode. I need to buy this fucking website. <laughs> uh, and then spend the next hour looking at other ones. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen how that goes before. It's quite amusing. Um, and while you're shelling out the shelling out the bickies there for League Freak, you can also go across to uh, patreon.com slash Project and throw a few coins my way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and over there, well, I don't have tears. I couldn't be bothered setting it up. So you just you, you chuck in whatever you think you, is good enough for you, and I'll be happy with that. Yeah, and there's like there's a lot of pretty exclusive content on there, isn't there? For in terms of stats, like I see you do posts on there quite often. Yeah, I have been doing a few on there. Some of them are um, for the Patreons only, and that's mm-hmm. um, rugby league profile pieces I've done on past players. Mm-hmm. A lot of those are only for Patreon's eyes only. Mm-hmm. And some of those will be chapters in a book that I'm currently working on that may get finished sometime before Christmas next year. Nice. That'd be <laughs> a nice a a stocking stuffer. Oh, yeah, it'll stuff the stocking. Don't you worry about that. Nice. You'll need two stockings because it'll be, it'll be a bit too girthy for the stocking. Sometimes it happens. It does happen. You know, it is if you try to put something really big and thick and ran into a small, you know. What the fuck's wrong with us? I don't know. We got to this point where we stopped talking about footy and we, the things just fell apart. Yeah. But still, it's still, we're so good at the footy part. We're still the number one rugby league podcast in the world. Yeah. I'm sure we are. Yeah. I'm not going to look at the facts, but, you know, I'll I'll take your word for it. Yeah. You're a pretty reputable source. Who told you that? Don't uh, listen to them. I, I I read it on leaguefreakiesareputablesource.com. Do you own that Fuck website off, as well? <laughs> I'm not doing that. Fuck off. <laughs> Piece of shit. Well, leaguefreakjournalist.com. <laughs> Ooh, that will rankle. Uh, oh, that's burning. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. You can check us out on Twitter at Fergo Freak Pod. We're on Instagram at Fergo Freak Pod. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, get around us. Go and give us a review on Apple. Give us five stars and give us a good review. Make it funny because we'll read it out as well. And we'll put it on the website and talk you up and have a good chat about it and make you famous for a little bit on our little show. Yeah. That's a great way to end it with that, yeah. So um, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you all next time.